learning is an instance of self-organization. Yeah, but self-organization can exist without learning. Oh, sure. Like in the, the number system. Um, anytime you have a dynamic system going towards equilibrium, it's self-organizing. The, 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 the system as a whole is organizing. Yeah. Uh, for example, if you place a child in a school, the interaction between the child and the teachers and the other children results in the child learning to read and write, usually, if it's a good school. That's a self-organizing system. So you design the interaction rules between the child and the school such that the child learns to read and write. But it's even more general than that. Let's say you want to produce steel from iron ore. Well, your iron ore is an iron oxide. And I'm not sure, three, four, or something like that. You put that in a blast furnace, which is coal, put in some oxygen, Heated, obviously, and what you get is uh, the oxygen combines with the others, so you get the separate CO2, carbon monoxide, plus water vapor, okay? So you put the components together in a suitable environment and they go in the direction you want them to go. It works in chemical equations, it works placing a, children, a child in school, and it works in managing an economy. So if you want your corporations to be environmentally responsible, you pass a set of laws that give them a tax break or put them in jail if they don't. And so, you constrain the interaction rules such that the corporations behave in the way you want. Uh, and in the case of private citizens, you can give people a tax break if they put more insulation in their home. So you give them a tax credit for the expenditures that they've made that create greater energy efficiency. By changing the rules, you change the behavior of the elements without changing the behavior of John Doe. You just say, if you do this, you will get this benefit. So many, many people change their behavior, and you haven't created a great regulatory apparatus, you've just created uh, a line on your tax form. So it's more efficient. Yeah, one, one more. Uh, excuse me, but uh, it's very, very important to have these. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, adaptation requires Uh, let, let me think about it. Yes. Yes. Requires adaptation. Yes. Right. Yes. Self-organization requires adaptation. No, 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 no. The adaptation yeah. requires self-organization. Self-organization is a very large concept. Mm -hmm. uh, adaptation is a smaller concept because some systems are adaptive and some are not. Okay, but virtually every system will self-organize and that it will go toward its stable equilibrial states whether it's uh, a, a piece of iron or a child in school or a corporation in an economy. But to be adaptive, you, can, you have to be able to organize yourself to be adaptive. To be adaptive, you have to be able to learn and you have to be able to give up a pattern of learning and acquire an additional pattern of learning when the first pattern doesn't work because the environment has changed. That's adaptation to a changing environment. Okay, so learning works in a stable environment. For a changing environment, you need adaptation. You need repeated learning. But all of that happens within a self-organizing system. Okay, so here's an example of a state-determined system. Now, earlier, 
Uh, it's called the dynamics of personality. It comes from Ross Ashby. Earlier we spoke about a system as a set of variables selected by an observer. And we said that the values of those variables define a state of a system. You don't need variables to define a state of a system. For example, in history, uh, you say, what happened in 1066? Well, the Normans invaded England. Okay. Um, that's an event. It could be a state of the system. It's, it, it, it happened. The Norman invasion was a particular state at that time or an event. Similarly, in a computer, you can have a sequence of operations. Do this, do that, do this, do that, do this, do that. Uh, you have a sequence of states or a sequence of events within the computer. So you can describe the behavior of a system as a sequence of events uh, whether you have variables or not. And that, here's an example. It's a personality. It's from Ross Ashby, who was a therapist. It's an example of a husband and wife uh, and their patterns of behavior. Each have a particular pattern of behavior. And then you have two initial conditions. The first initial condition is she comes in unexpectedly while he is smoking and startles him. And the second initial condition there at the bottom of the page says the dinner she has prepared proves to be burnt. And then everything else that happens follows automatically from their habitual modes of interaction, which is a sequence of events. So this is a series of if-then propositions. If he does this, she does this, or she does that, he does this, and so forth. Given those initial conditions, something happens. That's a very simple example. A slightly more complicated example is the history of Amasia. Okay. This is a little continent with four countries. Uh, and there are rules of how these countries behave, how they form alliances, uh, what their defensive strategy is. If somebody mobilizes on their border, what do they do? Uh, how do they maneuver in the event of a war? So if you look through this, you will see that uh, he defines the interaction rules, then he defines a set of earlier events, and then at the end, it, uh, near the top of the third page, uh, it was at this uneasy time that the United Nations decided to ensure peace in a really positive way. So was passed Resolution 641, binding upon all parties. And that resolution said, no country should mobilize on its neighbor's defenseless frontier. Should any country so act, its neighbors will immediately declare war on it and invade. So was the danger of war removed for all time, apparently. Okay, and then, after recording these high and statesmanlike activities, I find it almost ridiculous to have to report the next most significant event of the century was that Private Aldunk of the Alia Army staggered half drunk over the Yippian frontier and had to be forcibly ejected by Private Yipsky. But so it was. What followed, of course, stands to reason. And you can work through that, see what you see happened as a result of this incident. And if you want to see a larger version of it, you can read Barbara Tuckman's The Guns of August, which is about the outbreak of World War I. And there's a solution at the end on the last page for that one. Okay, so in each of these cases, the dynamics of personality, the man and the woman, and the history of Amasia, the case of international relations. We have the description of the behavior of a system in terms of the sequence of states. It's a set of if-then propositions. And you also have the playing out of a self-organizing system. Okay, so this concept of a self-organizing system is a highly general conception. It's a very, very general conception. You just define a closed, set of interaction rules and assume that there's energy to make the change from one state to another and then it just goes towards its stable equilibrial states. 
I'll tell you one more example of, uh, of a similar case of structure as a cause. And this is a true story. It happened when Ross Ashby was at the Biological Computer Laboratory and Heinz was the director. And there was a big blackout in the northeastern part of the United States. It's happened a couple times since then. But this was the first big one. And uh, so Ross comes rushing into Heinz's office. And he says, Heinz, look, there was a blackout in the Northeast. And Heinz says, yes, Ross, I know. And Ross says, I'll make you a bet. In a few days, they'll find the cause. Heinz sort of smiled and says, I won't take that bet. So a few days later, on the front page of the Champaign-Urbana Courier, there was a picture of a, of a circuit breaker. It's just, just a great big, huge switch that, uh, that you use to control the flow of electricity across the countryside and so forth. And it says, you know, this was the circuit breaker that failed that caused the Northeast blackout. And there was a picture of it on the front page. And Ross comes rushing into Heinz's office and says, Heinz, look, look, they found the cause. And they both had a great laugh. Now, my students never laugh. <laughs> so let me explain to you why they were chuckling. The idea was that the system should be designed such that the failure of a component does not bring down the whole system. Okay, there should be redundancy, there should be backup. And in fact, uh, normally that's what happens, that the system doesn't fail, but many things go wrong constantly from time to time. But every now and then, somehow something happens that overwhelms the capability of the system to respond. And that's what causes a blackout. Now, <clears throat> the second time it happened, which was a few years later, uh, the cause was said to have been a series of lightning strikes on a ridge near New York City, that apparently there's some electric power comes into the city, and you have a series of towers, and there was an electrical storm, and the lightning struck several places and knocked out that thing. And in the newspaper, of course, the managers of Consolidated Edison were asked why there was a blackout. Because the second time, it happened in the summer. And the first time, I think it happened in November. And it was cold, and so not much happened. But in the summer, uh, without air conditioning, people rioted. There were, you know, shops were broken into. So there were large losses to small businesses. And so people were angry, and they were angry at Consolidated Edison, and Consolidated Edison said, correctly this time, it was an act of God. Now, what do they mean by that? Well, you design a system to withstand a certain level of disturbance, and no farther. So that, for example, it is possible that a meteorite will land in the Atlantic Ocean off New York City and send a tidal wave that will flood New York City. And you could protect against that by putting up a huge dike around New York City to protect New York City. But the chances of that happening are very small, so you don't do it. And in the case of an electric power grid, there is the chance that you know, several things will go out simultaneously, but the chances of that are small, so you don't protect against that. And if you have this unusual lightning storm, then it is, in a sense, an act of God. And in a, you might say, well, the company should have made it more robust than they did, but nevertheless, they made it as robust as they thought they should have. This has been a big debate with regard to Katrina and how high the dikes should be. Do you protect against a, a 100 year storm or a 10,000 year storm as the Dutch do? But all of these are examples of a self-organizing system 